Also in advance, I want to thank the wonderful speakers ahead of me. Uh, I hope that they provide a good base for the wisdom and experiences uh, they will present. So my title is Moving from Out of Reach to Attainable. I'm playing on a title, on a term of a, a, a report that comes out of the National Low Income Housing Coalition every year called Out of Reach. And so the idea is they're trying to document what's out of reach, and I want us to think about how we make it attainable. Um, I'm going to do so by talking about, in broad uh, view of the landscape, the term attainable and what it means, why it matters now uh, that we collectively, and I emphasize collectively, think about housing attainability, and then some thoughts on strategies to make housing attainable. So what is attainable housing? To attain means to reach something and to exceed in achieving, and often we phrase it as achieving something that one desires and has worked for. This assumes you have the means to attain housing and that there is housing that fits your needs that you wish to attain. Now, if you ever watched House Hunters or any of those shows on uh, HGTV on the housing search prices, I do it for research, um, you'll know that the search for housing is always some sort of compromise, right? There's uh, the location's great for the family, but I have to drive far to work. Um, the, uh, there's more bedrooms, but we have to live in the suburbs to get them, which is true still today, by the way. And also, there's the, it's expensive in the city center, and it's small. So there's these kind of compromise we have to decide. Do I give up space for a location? Generally, that's a lot of the discussion. Um, and then there's color of walls and you know carpet and stuff like that. But you know we can change those things. It's the it's the physical place of housing I think that's most important. So when we talk about attainable housing, we focus first on price as it relates to income, and that's what some of the slides that I already showed you. So I can um, refer back to them. I want us to keep in mind today and to consider why some cannot easily attain housing when we think about the price point and income, and those are fundamental today. So. This is a clear definition. I'm substituting the word attainable for affordable, because typically this is what we say. Housing is affordable, but now we're using the word attainable. If you spend no more than 30% of your income on housing costs, now everyone's in their head doing it, right? They're doing the math, right? Um, but the reason I, I note that the substitution of the word is because it's become more in fashion um, to talk about it being attainable, because we associate affordable with a, a sort of a negative connotation of either publicly subsidized housing, public housing literally, um, and we also associate it with lower income people. So keep that in mind too, because lower income is, is actually a lot higher than a lot of people think about. Because really this is purely semantics. Attainable housing is often aimed at people earning between 60 and 100% of the area median income. Um, you can, if you know what they are in different places in Chicago, the area median income is now up to close to $80,000. So that's, you think about that, what that is in terms of income, what people um, are being targeted for. However, interestingly, public housing today in the United States can be occupied by people earning up to 80% of the AMI. That's not how it works, but the policy allows it. So 80% of AMI is considered low income in the United States. Keep that in mind. So the other thing that I always talk about with this definition is what you can afford is relative to your income. 30% of $20,000 is a $500 a month rent. 30% of $100,000 means you can afford $2,500 a month. Okay, so that's a big difference. The other part of this is the 70% that is left over, assuming you're paying 30%. We know that you could live on, at $100,000, you would have approximately $5,800 a month to live on. If you're at 20,000, what do you have to live on? About $1,100 a month to cover all the other expenses, food, clothing, you know, transportation, such like that. So keep that, keep that in mind as we think about affordability in this 30% rule. So according to the National Apartment Association, a trade organization, um, we have an attainable housing scourge. I had to look that word up to remember what it really meant. Uh, it's a very powerful word, word actually here, I think, because the word means a person or thing that causes great trouble or suffering, right? I thought that was a fitting word for what is happening today. So how do we know there's a scourge? Well, we have a cost burden problem, and this is something that we, are, we get to if we think about if you pay more than 30% of your income, what do you end up seeing? 
you are going to be paying 35. Mostly the crisis is because we have people paying 50% or more as renters. I'm going to focus on renters here for a minute because it is the biggest crisis and the most long-going crisis to the point where we consider it a chronic problem. Okay, it's a chronic problem. It's a given now in our system in most cities. In the 1990s, we had an affordable housing crisis. Renters, especially low-income renters, were paying more than 30% of their income for housing. We started noting this. Homeowners were not necessarily at this point. Um, just to keep that in mind, that really picked up in the, tw the 21st century, the beginning of uh, the, the pre-recession period. So before the Great Recession, we also saw an increase in owners being burdened at all income levels. This came as lenders offered options to borrow more money than the long-standing practice of two and a half times your income, which kept owners for decades paying on average about 28% of their income for housing costs. The result was, though, by upping this percentage that you were allowed, I know I was offered a loan uh, to buy my condo where I would pay about 45% of my income. We were seeing estimates of people paying five and six times their income for housing before the recession. So the lending practices really amped up this opportunity for inaffordability in um, housing. Granted, people make choices and all that. But so what we saw was, as a result of that time period, was that people who were buying homes were often buying more home than they could afford. Recession hits, what happens? They're underwater. Um, and so they're stuck, they're stuck with some of this, um, this condition of, of having too much housing for what they can afford. And often they cannot sell. So we've seen the devastating results and the so-called market correction to reduce uh, these kinds of transactions. So that resulted in stricter, stricter lending rules and more money down. Um, the reaction to developers, which is what I really want to focus on today, was to switch from building for sale housing, especially condos, um, and to, to switch to rental units, which continues to be a growth market. While this trend post-recession was due in part to shrinking and more restrictive credit for buyers, it was also helpful to, and perhaps even responsive to, the changing demand among millennials and aging boomers. Now, I apologize to millennials in the audience. I'm not trying to lump you all together. It's just an easy category at this point. I'm a baby boomer, so I take that on, too. Um, but this is for, for both categories who were seen as not necessarily wanting to own. Baby boomers wanting to get out of the empty nest that they had, but millennials also looking at circumstances that were going to maybe prevent them from even being able to buy, including credit problems and big debt um, associated with going to higher education. So this would prevent many from getting mortgages in the first in the first place. So the solution of switching to rental housing sounded like maybe a win-win situation. However, not for everyone. While developers found a new business model that was producing ROI, or return on investment, it was not necessarily producing attainable housing. But then I was reading this last week, according to the NAA, the National Apartment Associations, a funny thing happened on the way to the apex of the housing crisis in 2019. For-profit apartment developers started to produce more attainable, or workforce housing, another term for it, housing apartments that lease um, out for less and without public funds. My first reaction was, hmm, what affordable housing crisis in 2019, right? <laughs> and then I recalled. What we're seeing, and I'm watching it more in Chicago, as the developers are pulling out of building, they have different reasons for it, but we think that the market is saturated of what is this kind of building, which is more the luxury rental um, rate uh, apartments, um, nice views though, uh, and, but that have been built and that are actually replacing what people would be paying for if they could buy a condo. The, often the costs for these are a little bit more expensive even than condos would be if you were buying it, the mortgage price. However, what you're saving is the cost of leaving, the cost of entry and leaving, actually, right? When you buy, you have to put money down. When you leave, you have to be able to sell it. This way, you can just pay the cost of a moving van. You can leave this apartment if it doesn't work for you. So we see that this was the building that was happening in the last um, roughly 10 years. However, this, what this meant is that people with higher incomes were now paying more than 30% of their income for housing. And you see this in the data, the rising number of people in higher income brackets that are housing burdened. And hence, a new affordable rental housing crisis. So how did they know there was a market correction? Because we see more of this being produced. The rise of the market, uh, the micro units and smaller for sale options like tiny homes. Um, and so this has become the solution. The response is we build smaller. We also don't put as much luxury into it. Um, 
So developers see this as both meeting demand and responding to the need for attainable housing, and supposedly doing it without any public assistance. I think that was an interesting part of the quote, too. But when we pencil it out, the question is attainable for whom? So here's the income target that many of these apartment buildings are going for. But the important thing is, so 160 to 120% of AMI, so it's higher income. The other thing is that 400 square foot unit size. That's not family housing. Well, it could be, and actually in other countries it is. But in the United States, we have some restrictions and we try to think about how a family of four would not live in 100, 400 square feet. So right there, we're starting to think about who housing is being built for. The other part of this equation is the really no public funds. That was my you know, kind of gut check. I was like, hmm. Then I went and read on what they were, how they were doing it. They were using opportunity zones, which is great. Uh, I mean, they're interesting. Uh, but they're using this new tool, right? <laughs> um, they're using impact fees, so that they're getting waived. Um, they're also reducing parking requirements. So these are actually public investments, right? And I, and I don't think we, shouldn't be, we should not have public investments. Um, after all, housing is a critical part of our infrastructure. The problem here is they're building homes that limit who can live in our communities. And the public should question this. So why does it matter? We need more than a housing market correction if we are going to make housing attainable for renters and owners in the coming decade and decades, I'd say. Solutions require understanding and addressing the structural conditions that perpetuate this affordability problem, including growing income inequality, housing costs outpacing wages, um, and more precarious workforce. So a couple years ago, the National League of Cities put out a report, and there were others at the same time raising the real question about how does affordable housing and the shortage of it really impact the growth of our cities. And what you see is that the result of this survey found, and there's more details to this, that it was an economic barrier for 42% of US cities. I think that's important for us to keep in mind and listen to the mayors who are talking about this and talk to the mayors who are talking about this. The other thing that people are noting is that it is affecting our inequality in the United States and in different regions. Um, what you see in this chart is different colors represent different regions of the United States, and it's over time from the 1929 after the stock market crash to the current, which is 2017. This is um, the Hamilton Project out of the Brookings Institution, Institute, excuse me, and so you can see um, this is they're trying to focus on this relationship. So what the chart shows is for much of the 20th century, economic outcomes were converging across the US. But that began to change in the 1970s with the decline in manufacturing and the onset of the knowledge economy. As a result, the economies of different regions begin to diverge. This point of change, the early 1980s especially, is when we start seeing the, the start of our affordable housing crisis. And I hadn't looked at it through this lens before, and I started thinking that's when we always say, oh yeah, back in the 80s, something changed. This is part of it, and a significant part, I would add. So the other thing is to start thinking about this in the context of the United States and growing inequality as many people are mapping it out. This is from Governing Magazine. These are a little dated, but it was the best I had in terms of a graphic across the country. It's from 2012. I will tell you from the census data, the growth in inequality is generally continuing to, grow, to increase. Um, so the bigger the circle, the bigger the disparity. If people are not familiar with a measure that we uh, urban regionalists uh, use, uh, we uh, look at the Gini coefficient, which really basically is a measure of how far apart the income groups are at the high and the low. Um, the closer to one, the more the inequality or the dispersion. And so at this rate, um, the US is ranked at a Gini coefficient of 0.45. Uh, it's been rising. Um, I will say that at this rate, we are going to surpass Africa and the South in terms of our income disparities. And just to put it on record, at the same time that this number was recorded for the US, it was the same for this region and for Chicago as well, which we know we're surpassing this too. So what's happening in a lot of these places, not all but most, especially as we see people competing for you know, where the next thing is in terms of growth and workforce development, et cetera, is that in most cases, the growing income level at the top is correlated with growing numbers of highly educated workers. Um, and, and also, at the same time, growth in tech of all kinds. Now, I'm not saying these are bad things. It's just that we know that both of those things usually correlate with higher income levels. The other thing, though, that is really important to think about, and this gets into thinking about the ability for someone to buy a home, 
is the precarious nature of some of this work at both the high and the low level, low income levels, right? So uh, whether you want to call it gig work, the platform economy, precarious labor, more and more of our labor is growing this way. And there are debates on when you look at the data, how much it's growing, how fast it's growing, but it is growing. Um, I spent a lot of time looking at this for another project, so I, I, I can give you citations if you want later. What this means is that we have a shrinking number of employees with social protections. Why should this affect attainability? So social protections that come with employment typically, um, such as health care, such as uh, retirement benefits, you know, things like that that we used to count on. Um, I work for a state that doesn't guarantee I necessarily always have my retirement, so I'm really conscious of that. Um, but when you cannot firmly say how much your next check will be, even if you know where it will come from, it's hard to get a mortgage. Just being real. It's even hard to get an apartment sometimes. So just think about that. I may know where it's coming from, Uber, Lyft, whatever consulting firm I'm working for, but I may not know how much because I may not have a good contract um, on a monthly basis or weekly basis or a yearly basis. And if you do not have affordable health care, you will not likely feel that you have the ability to pay a mortgage every month. Um, you have to pay for something, so you're more likely to default to renting. So kind of moving us forward, how can we make housing to be made attainable? There are those people who believe we can totally build our way out of this problem. Totally. At this rate, I'm not sure, uh, as we've seen, that that's the solution, but let's talk through that as an argument. According to the National um, Association of Home Builders, there's good reasons for us to turn to this, because not only is it going to generate more, affordable, more housing, not necessarily affordable, more housing that we may need, the assumption being that if we build the housing, it will prevent us from um, hurting people who are in low-income housing because we're replacing the housing that people are seeking out. So, you know, gentrification is based on this premise, right? So the idea is that we will build more housing, it will prevent us from losing the affordable housing we have, and it will also have economic benefits for which include tax base and workers having um, jobs. And usually these are good paying jobs, right? Often uh, they're generally associated with union wages and such like that. So that's a good argument, and I don't disagree with it. Um, and this, by the way, has always been the argument for building housing in the United States. If you go back to the history of U.S. housing policy in the 1930s, the first argument to actually be made, for, to, to actually get a public housing policy in place, as well as to think about shifting to our mortgage system we have today, was it was a jobs creator. And why do we look at housing starts every year as part of our economic uh, measure of economic health is because it's seen as a job creator as well as putting money into our GDP. So we have to think about this. It's not a bad argument to talk about housing as an economic development strategy. However, if it's not producing the housing you need for your workforce, that's where the problem is. But affordable housing folks, like the National Long Housing Coalition, they've gotten in this game too. They've come up with the same arguments because they have to fight against the social question, the moral question. Like, how do I convince you to actually build affordable housing because it's the right thing to do? And I can tell you it's a very complicated conversation to have. But when you can start to show it as an economic impact, an economic benefit, the argument goes, maybe we'll have more success. And so this has been the direction that people have been going in the last few years as well to argue for more federal funds as well as other tools to be able to make affordable housing. By the way, they're arguing for affordable housing up to $50,000 dollars um, on an annual basis. The thing that's important is in common across both development arguments is the same thing, economic impact and improvements for people, the tax base, et cetera. The thing that's different with this one is that a lot of people think, oh, it's affordable housing, it must be cheaper. You don't want that, do you? No, you don't want poor quality of affordable housing. You want good quality affordable housing. So a lot of the same housing we're trying to build for affordable, to be affordable to lower income people is often costing us about the same amount and sadly sometimes more per square foot because of all the layers of finance. How many people do development finance? Oh, bless you. No one, oh yeah, right? You, you know the layers, they keep adding costs. So the people who know this nod. So I want to point that out as well. It's not against all my friends who work in the business, but it is expensive to do affordable housing because of all the layers we put in place to make it happen and to keep those costs and rent down. So while these units can add to the affordable housing stock, in the case particularly where we know federally subsidized housing because it's required, 
They do not keep pace with what is getting lost due to demolition and replacement with luxury units in most of our cities. So this building our way out of the problem is really not the solution or the only solution. Because what we're seeing now is we are chasing the problem rather than solving the problem. So the question really is, can we totally build our way out of this problem? Let's talk about why not and then what we can start thinking about um, differently. So I will talk briefly about some of the, uh, what we call the supply side strategies. Uh, in development world, we talk about supply and demand. Um, some of the supply side strategies here are what are seen as relatively speaking, I get further down, they're a little more costly, but relatively speaking, low, low cost or low hanging fruit in our development toolkit. Um, what we can see is that, uh, for example, a lot of people are talking about how do we prevent NIMBY, not in my backyard. What we see is over the history of building affordable housing, especially maybe rental housing, or any housing that might be people have questions about um, who's going to be their neighbor, the not in my backyard has risen. Now, in places where you have zoning that allows it, say it's zoned for you know, residential density that it can allow you know, a certain number of built apartment buildings, we would say you should be able to build it. But what has happened is we've allowed the public comment, and I'm not against public comment, I teach urban planning, but we've allowed the public comment to start to dictate uh, what is happening in those already allowed uses. We don't do the same when it comes to the planned unit development. You know, we, we don't see the same kind of response. In fact, as an example, in Chicago, there was an affordable housing building, uh, apartment building that was going to go up, transit-oriented, fabulous development, penciled out really nicely, going to accommodate veterans and families, and you know, all this in a neighborhood that is gentrifying incredibly. Um, and uh, they had approval for it, and then like a year later, because the process is slow, it came to a point where there was some public input, and suddenly everyone turned out and said, no, 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 we can't have that. It had already been approved to certain levels. And so this conversation sort of turned to, like, why is this happening now? This site allows us to be. We are going to make this a decent place for people to live, and they should be able to live there. It, by the way, it, it went through. But it was an interesting exercise to watch and very fraught with um, a lot of challenges. But so that's what I mean preventing NIMBY in the basic way of like just saying, let development happen the way we planned our cities to be. Okay, so that's one of the ways. The idea of bonuses and waivers I mentioned earlier, so that can be like parking breaks, right? So in Chicago, I'm gonna use Chicago because I know those well enough, but other places have this. We started looking at smaller units and saying, well, you probably don't also have a car. So we're not gonna require the same amount of parking requirements. And if it's transit oriented, that's even better. Sort of skipping ahead to that as an example. Um, some waivers that you can give, sort of, you know, the, the trade-offs. Density bonuses, um, you know, they're things that we do. They're, they're part of our everyday toolkit for affordable housing development. We've also seen for the last 20 years the idea of mixed income housing. Uh, and I am someone who has mixed feelings about it, but if it's one way to us, for us to start to get more housing, then that's a great way to go. We have an affordable housing, requir housing requirements, or the ARO as it's called, um, and it says that basically in certain areas uh, you have to build on site up to 10 to 20 percent of the housing has to be affordable, but also there are other sort of uh, things that go along with this. We do allow and in lieu of, but we really want to have you build on site. Perfect. So the the last or the next one I mentioned transit linkage, obviously t transit oriented development or TOD. That's what we really like to see. Um, you again, the, the downside of that development, the data has shown, is that it's mostly been these smaller units. So it's either accommodating, and the data shows either young singles or older singles. And so the question is, how do we make this sort of mix of family and singles to make that work? So um, the last two here are community land trusts, or land trusts as they're called, which is basically a way to, if you've done the development, how do you keep it affordable in perpetuity? We used to not think that much about it because we're like, oh, it's affordable, it's in a neighborhood that's never gonna change, it'll be great, decent housing, but we don't have to worry about it. Now we're seeing those neighborhoods change. And some of the housing we built in it is now um, no longer needs to be affordable because the, the restrictions have changed, whatever. So community land trusts have become a tool for which when you build affordable housing, you actually put it into a land trust. And the idea is in perpetuity, you try and restrict and I know that's a bad word sometimes, but you, you limit the, price, the increase in price of the for sale unit or the increase in rents by a fixed amount, maybe 5%. So you keep it so it's reasonable. Um, as an example of a land trust having an impact on affordable housing, 
in Burlington, Vermont, the, the land trust there that's been in existence for almost 50 years, the same house that you could buy 50 years ago for you know, an income level about 50% of AMI, you can still get that today for the same income level. So the land trust is a way to kind of tamp down kind of the escalating prices that can happen in a development boom. The idea of limited equity is another way to do that, to limit how much equity. We don't say you can't have any equity, equity when you sell your home, but we at least say when you sell it, we have a formula. How long have you lived here? Let's make sure you get some benefit from this, but we're not going to make sure you get a huge amount that could then restrict the affordability. The idea is the longer you can sustain the affordability, the better that public investment is in helping the community now and in the future. The other benefit of building and using some of these strategies is that, well, you can start to do things like make housing more accessible for people with disabilities, which a lot of older housing may not be. The other is you can work on energy efficiency. And that's something that can keep affordable housing more affordable too. We know that from looking at keeping the energy costs down. But the problem is that when we're focusing only on development, you continue chasing rather than solving the problem, as I said earlier. So let's talk to demand, and I will close out like talking about this issue from the tax perspective, and I mean, sorry, from the income perspective. So there are a couple strategies that we use on the supply side that focus on the consumer. Um, these are, are being supported now as part of a package of strategies by more and more people kind of in, I guess, more the liberal think tanks, I will admit that. But it's people who are saying we need probably both. So uh, this includes housing subsidi subsidies, such as vouchers, to make up for the difference in what people can afford, and the fair market rent, which uh, um, Ali showed earlier. Um, and also, to make the voucher more effective at helping people access higher income communities, we make sure that the community is using the, fair, the small area median rents. I'm not sure if people are familiar with this, but several years ago, the Department of Housing and Urban Development realized that, oh, if we just have the median rent, what it means is that people can't actually access housing in higher income areas where the rent is higher than the median. That's how medians work. You have some below and some above, right? So they're tending to gravitate to the lower income areas, the more affordable housing. So this was a way to break up your city by zip code and see what the rents are. And so now it's supposedly, we'll have to see how it plays out in the next few years, supposedly going to free up and make it possible for people to use their vouchers in higher income areas. So I think that's a really important thing to also emphasize. Um, unfortunately, our city, for some reason, the county, the housing authority doesn't seem to think we need it, um, which is not true. Um, so I'm going back to work on that when I get home. Um, but perhaps the most controversial idea is what I want to close on, which is the, the housing wage. So in this graph, Let's look at why it's important for us to think about housing wages. Um, we have a structural problem that is not going away. What this graph shows is that post-recession, um, and especially beginning in the 2000s, but post-recession recovery, rents have continued to go up at a faster rate than income, which is, I think, what was said earlier um, today. And rent, so really what we see is that renter income is not catching up to the cost of rent. For those policymakers and planners that want to convert renters into home buyers, this chart should worry you. How can you save for a down payment or feel secure in, a pur in purchasing a home in these circumstances? Even knowing that a mortgage will remain relatively flat, that is your monthly payment will stay flat, um, you'll, as a new home buyer over time, what is the assurance your income will keep up with rising taxes and utilities once you get in? So to kind of put this in perspective and starting to think about housing wage, we can look at what the National Low Income Housing Coalition maps out. And yes, you are in the highest wage bracket. You have to have more than $20 an hour to afford housing. And more precisely in this area, which by the way, a lot of these correlate with the growing income inequality map I showed early. This is your data um, roughly representing what um, Ali showed earlier. Um, but let's just kind of put this in perspective. Uh, when we look at this, we find that the current minimums in the state of Washington, which is, I believe, $12 an hour, uh, and Tacoma or Seattle, which I know ranges between like $13.50 and $16.35 um, for those large chain um, and with 500 plus employees, from what I've read. But when I look at this, this does not say low income renter, <laughs> right? These income levels to afford housing now, today, and these are the medians, right? These are the medians, and everyone competing for the same housing. So, you know, I'm, I'm, like, I'm walking around the road going, I'm only going to pay 30% of my, housing, my income for housing. If I'm at 75000 I can pay 20%, I'm taking it. So the competition is stiff for the housing below these rents, 
And they're competing with people who have more cash on hand to do it. Okay, just keep that in mind. So these are not low-income people. So to, to kind of provoke you to think about why raising minimum wage even maybe higher <laughs> could be important, um, and I call it housing wage because it's linking it to the housing problem. So here's my proposal. Let's push for housing wages. To me, they are equivalent to the goal of keeping housing affordable in perpetuity, just as much as community land trusts are and public housing was when it was striving, when we had it and thriving. But only now we're doing it through wages, right? We're doing it through wages. We're thinking about raising our wage, getting our wages there. I know it's complicated, but it is important for all of us collectively to work together on. Further, we need to argue the public benefit. Just like those arguing for more building on the supply side, we can show impact beyond the immediate renters and owners, impact on communities and our tax base. This is the study we did for Illinois um, uh, before we got our, our minimum wage raised to 15 from 8.25 an hour, so nearly doubling it. This was touted around the state by uh, legislatures. Fortunately, we also had a governor change. Um, but what we really wanted to focus on, how many people benefit from this? This is one third of our workers, 8% of our owners, 21% 20 of our renters. And the other question I always asked is, is it going to affect unemployment? We did see it have a slight decrease, but that's in the immediate sense, and you have to think about course corrections there. But the other thing was, and it shouldn't be on the bottom, it should be maybe on the top, it's going to generate, could generate $2.4 billion in taxes annually for our state, which then can go back into other types of social service and pro um, programs. So to close, I want to just make this statement. We should build attainable housing, but we also need to work to make housing attainable. Thank you. Jumped him. Shout. Hello. Hi. Sorry. It's okay. <laughs> My name is Anastasia Kale. I work at the Tacoma Housing Authority, and I'm a proud alumni of UWT. So Ooh. love oh. everyone here. <laughs> when you were discussing different um, ways to make housing attainable, you were talking about mixed income housing and how you don't like you had mixed feelings on it. I was wondering if you could explain more about how you feel about mixed income housing. Yeah. I, I like to use the word phrase, the phrase mixed, right? Because so the, the biggest problem I have, thanks for that question too, because I think it's a good one, and it's not one that uh, is an easy answer to, but I'll, I'll give you a few thoughts on it. Um, one of the things that I, I, I'm concerned about is it, it's mixed income when it originated and where I had the most concern was in the public housing arena where we were replacing 100% public housing, that affordable up to 80% AMI that I said earlier, with a mix, and in the case of some cities like Chicago, even a mix of very high income because we were doing for sale market rate housing as well as low income um, public housing, and somewhere in between rental housing through the low income housing tax credit program. But what it did was, at a time when in the city of Chicago and many cities across the country, Low income people, and especially very low income people who were living in public housing, had really no choice but public housing. Um, we were taking it away. And we were adding more, afford, more expensive housing at a time, again, pre recession, when people had more choices at the higher end. So there was just a conundrum for me. I'm like, why are we doing this? I get it because mixed income makes sense in terms of the social mixing and the idea of not segregating. So I'm not against that. It's just that we weren't finding solutions for the disappearance of that subsidized housing. The other problem I run into is, and I don't know what your ratio here in this region is, but in Chicago, the ratio of public um, housing to non-public housing is 4% at the most, it used to be 4%, now it's probably 2% of our housing stock was public housing. The other 98% is not. So I said, well, interesting strategy here. We're focusing on mixed income with all these expectations of social mixing, you know, and all these things that were gonna happen as a result of it, uh, including people talking about reducing poverty. 
when we're not dealing with the other 98% of the highly economically segregated parts of our region. So that's really where I struggle with it. The third is that when we look at it, to get three, and when we look at it in the market side of it, to get three units of affordable housing, we have to add seven more if, if you're doing a 30-70 split, which is a lot, what is a big goal for some people, usually it's two to eight. Every time we build those eight or those seven, we only build two or three. We're already behind if affordable housing is needed. Do you see? So it's like we're chasing the problem is what many people talk about. We see it in New York, especially when they introduce very aggressive policies, but we're still behind. In Chicago, we're seeing the same thing. So that's my whoever, she's out there. Thank you for the question. I'm Catherine Rudolph, and I work for the Pierce County Executive. For a long time, I was the Government Affairs Director for the Realtors Association. You've done a nice job of explaining barriers to entry to home ownership, but locally we seem to have a lot of barriers to entry to rental housing, which is the landlord expects the first, last, and deposit, and that is often much more than a lower income person can afford. Have you seen any solutions for that nationally? Yeah, it's interesting. We've actually done better on the for sale side, right? Because we come down with down payment assistance um, grants, right? So we have not done a good job of that, of recognizing. And, and you didn't even mention the non-monetary co uh, cost of entry that many people can't succeed, priors. If you go now to secure, if you go to rent an apartment, you often have to pay one, maybe $35, $40, $50, to get a background check basically done on you as a renter. And if it shows up, whether you know what's on, keep doing, sorry, whether you know what's on your record or not, it could be bad credit, it could be you got, um, uh, you had to move out of an apartment because the landlord defaulted. I mean, we've seen all this. People are not even able to get in the door because of that. So it's a very good question. I think the challenge we've had is that people are not thinking that the deposit and uh, the, the um, first month rent are a barrier. They're like, oh, you can find that. It's like, no, people can't. And that, if you've ever read the book Nickled and Dimed, which is from the 90s, I believe, she talks extensively about why people doubled up in hotels, for example, in Florida, or why people were not able to get into apartments uh, because they couldn't save enough money for that down payment. So I don't have an answer to it, but we should start looking for the solution. So thank you for that question. Yeah. yeah. Hi, I'm Nancy Henderson. I'm a council member with the town of Stellicum. I have to confess, I feel a little bit in enemy territory because I'm a kook, but <laughs> I'm uh, very interested in what small towns and cities can do to help alleviate this housing attainability crisis, perhaps we can say that we're seeing. I did read the statistics, and perhaps you can validate this, that for every $100 increase in the cost of a rental, that an, that can have an impact up to 15% of increase in homelessness. I don't know if that Ooh. merges with what you have heard or not, but that was from a different lecture. It might have even been from the gentleman to my right here. I'm not sure. Ali, is that your data? <laughs> yeah. Okay. I, no, I'd like to see that data. Um, that's an interesting one to correlate, because that's a kind of complicated one to correlate, too. It would be complicated. I don't have a reference for that, so I cannot validate that. Well, let, I, let's get back to the question you had first, which is, what can you do? In, is that what you're yes. asking? Yes. Well, I want to just comment. We had a land use issue yesterday. It was a large area that was, it's about a five and a half acre area, and we had uh, the approval process as a council to allow them to downsize from what had been, well, let's say it this way, it had been previously a 19 home development with open space, a planned area development, if right. you will, where the, even though the lot size is 9,600, you can make the, the, the homes on smaller lot sizes and set aside open space right. land use. But the new owners who bought the property wanted to change this and make it full-size homes. So each home on 9,600 or more, up to 12,000 12, square feet per lot, that would be 15 homes instead of 19. So in our ordinance, frankly, we had no choice. We had no choice because it's not in our code. It's in the code that they have options, and we cannot whimsically decide as a council right. that we want to so I, my point is that I, I think at a, at a small city area, we need to know what can we do to impose codes that would not be met with so much backlash because frankly, nobody wants to restrict 
people want to live in wider space areas, even in urban centers. What can we do as a small town to change this? Right. So whether small town or large town, uh, the principle of zoning and other, you know, the kind of tools that we, that planners actually were like, we have police powers of the state. Let's not abuse them. You know, so we think about that a lot. And we want to also, they give security and assurity, right, to a community and developers what the future will look like, right? So you don't want to be messing with them too much. But what we have found is um, there are ways to, to use the word trigger sort of discussion about what that use would look like. So, for example, in uh, Chicago, if you are going to build a development that has 10 or more units, and for diff either the zoning has to be changed or you're getting some public subsidy, that automatically triggers a requirement that you look at the affordable housing requirements. Now, in this case, you could think about it strategically from a density, uh, from densities, right? You're going from actually a, what would seems like a higher density, right, to a lower density based on the new development. But what you could think about, though, also, and you can argue it, from it, argue it from an environmental perspective as well, is how to use that land more effectively, not to restrict some of the homes being of large size and large lot, but also look at how you can have a mix of housing there so that you can actually have some smaller units, still single family, but they can be accommodating in some more, more of a cluster area. And I'm, I'm basing this on looking at a development that happened in the Chicago area where it was a large a horse farm that someone was selling. And they had this plan of just, you know, the usual planned unit development. And someone came in and said, no, there's some beautiful environmental features here, but also we want to have it um, the connection closer to where the transit stop is. Let's have some density there. And they worked it through. But I think before you can have that conversation at City Hall, you have to have that conversation in your community. So when we talk about, um, in our, we have a, on, on our website, we have a gentrification toolkit. Not how to gentrify, but how to mitigate or <laughs> offset the, the potential negative effects. We're not anti-development, but we're trying to look at the actual consideration of displacement. The reason I bring that up is the first step we say, no matter where you're at in the process, you could be not gentrifying at all or you could be gentrifying. The same goes here. If you are concerned that there's an affordability in your community, the first step is to talk to each other and not just talk to your friends who agree with you. You have to have the uncomfortable conversations with everyone about what their fears are, what their concerns, and come loaded with data at the right time. Don't start with it. It uh, freaks people out. But you start to talk about that and use that and say, what do we want our community to be like in the future? I did this in Highland Park, Illinois, which is a very expensive um, suburb. Of, of it. We did this in Winnetka, which is even more expensive. But we had a conversation with the community first. But we have to be prepared that those developments, and the other thing I would say is to look at your map now of your land and who owns it and start to think where they may be going with it and what they can do. Not to, to temper with their, you know, to, to mess with their zoning and their, their right to develop, but just to think what might happen in five to 10 years and what do we need to be prepared for? Because the worst thing is to come into City Hall and have a conversation when you're not prepared, right? And that's on the city side as well as the community side. Is that? It helps, thank you very much. Oh, hi. Yes, hi, my, my name is Michael Brinson and I'm a council member for the city of Lakewood. And we're a neighbor of Ellicum to do that. But uh, my thought is, is that in, in, in suburban environments where there are multiple jurisdictions, mm -hmm. multiple cities and things to do that, that uh, how realistic is it for individual cities yeah. to go yeah. out and try to deal with it? Or is this really have to be dealt with regionally? uniform policies, county, regionally, at the state level, and that's a discussion that goes on here in Washington State where we have a great affinity for local control mm -hmm. of everything and particularly things that are in, in this area, and yet it results in a great deal of, of difference yes. between how, how things are done, even within short distances from each other. Yeah. Um, and it plays into your, your, your NIMBY uh, comment and things to do there. So what realistically is yeah. the best geographic area to try oh. to come together to make, yeah. make, make solutions? And I guess the second part of my question is, for many, many decades that the uh, whenever we've gotten feedback about defining the problem, it's always been around this 30% mm -hmm. number. And it, it kind of then makes you look like, well, we're gonna be tilting at windmills because we're never gonna get back to 30% being 
a reasonable norm uh, in this country uh, to do that. And how do you go about assigning for your own policy perspectives what really is a, is a realistic target? Mm. Well, I would say that we have, just to answer the second question first, we actually have started to go back to that affordability for the for sale side because we had course corrections. Post-recession, banks were like, we can't give you jumbo loans anymore with no money down. Go figure. So now they're saying we actually have to look at your income and we have to look at what you can afford. So we've actually kind of tried to move towards dealing with that. We still have people who are struggling because they bought before recession, but a lot of that in the for sale market has been adjusted. The thing is that that has restricted now how many people can get into for sale housing. On the rental side, there is no one telling you as a renter, oh, don't pay more than 30%, girl. Because you just show up and you're like, this is what I can afford. The landlord might question your ability to pay that. So I have to think we have to think about like there are two different kind of strategies and markets and uh, mechanisms there at play. Um, and that there is a question, though, about maybe we should raise that threshold to 35% um, because of utility costs. And so this does now come up there. But um, I think that the, the solution isn't necessarily about adjusting with the affordability amount. It's that 30% or 35%. It's actually to say, why isn't that working if we think that that was supposed to be a good way to do this? And that's why switching to thinking about uh, housing wage, we switched to living wages. The housing wage is really to say, this is how much you can afford. And then afterwards, you have to be able to afford other things. So certain things have gone down. The cost of food has gone down a little bit, but a lot of the other expenses have gone up. So we have, to, we have to look at it as a whole package is my point, okay? So that's why I want us to always think about 30% of what's left over. And if you start to look at it as living wages, the same dollars amounts start to come up in terms of what people need to be able to have sustainable, you know, sustain their life every year. 50,000 to 50 to 75,000 is becoming now expected in some of our communities. So that's the income, that's the sort of my answer to that 30% of income. Um, but people make decisions on their own, and renters have more ability to actually get into debt um, or get into that affordability problem than, than owners do now. On the other part of the scale of right of thinking about this, not just one community trying to do this or deal with this problem, or the flip side is, I don't have to deal with it because another community is dealing with it. And that's often what happens. Um, just an anecdote, I was doing an affordable housing plan for the village of Winnetka, and I was told in a focus group that a neighboring community was their affordable housing strategy. I thought, wow. So, but in seriousness, in our region, we have a regional housing initiative, and it really is for the communities through the leadership, the mayors and others, to come together and talk about affordable housing, actually to think strategically how we work together and actually share in the, the burden, but the benefit as well of this affordable housing. So we're not pitting each other against each other. We know from economic development, that that doesn't work, right? You're all chasing after the same thing. Uh, you want to actually think about how we're not chasing or how we're not pushing to somewhere else, but how we're sharing. And I know that's a hard thing for, for communities and leaders to do, especially when leadership changes. I hope you're in your office for a long time, sir. But you know, when you think about the changes over time in terms of leadership. But again, it's not just the leaders. The leaders have to reflect what the community wants, and the community has to reflect what the leaders want. So. So I guess what I'm trying to say is that regional is an important um, level. What your region would look like, um, it's hard to say because you have to think about not just today, but what it's going to be in 10 years in terms of the demand for the housing in your community now. And who is coming to that? So as we know, I don't, we don't talk about the place down the road, but we know, I know from my students' research that there's a lot of demand up here for your housing because it's affordable, relatively speaking, but also if people are looking for single family solutions or family solutions in general, in their life course, they're gonna probably have to travel further and they're looking north, not south, or not west, I'm sorry. Um, so there's that. So I think you need to think regional, state, and local and how you work those together. And I can talk more offline if you like about that. Um, some things, examples that we've been seeing um, that are effective. Is there one more? Yeah, real quick. Oh, sorry, I'm sorry. Good morning, Don Morrison. I run co-working spaces uh, here cool. in town. And uh, my question kind of revolves around that for residential. I, have, I didn't see any alternate or new uh, residential uh, structures kind of being discussed. And also, what is the role of uh, skills development and workforce development in all of this? Oh, boy, you, we could be here for hours. Thank you. So this is the basically been the solution. This is kind of... I wouldn't call it the WeWorks of housing. Um, actually, the WeWorks of housing is dorms. 
Have you seen that, right? The dorms, I didn't want to even bring those up because they're problematic for me, <laughs> but the dorm space where you're getting down to 125 to 130 square feet. And so, and, and it's the solution to what used to be in Silicon Valley. My brother did this for many years. You sleep on someone's couch five days a week and then you go to your home in the weekend. So instead of that, now we have dorms you can move into. And then you can go back to where your housing is, or this may be your housing. So, I, you know, I lived in a dorm when I was in college. Fine, I thought I'd leave that when I left college, but what we're seeing is that's now what we're coming up. To me, that the, the answer to that question, when I hear that as the answer to the question of affordable housing, or when I heard a developer tell me that micro units were uh, in high demand, I said, well, when I look at the square footage cost, it's not that different, it's just smaller. It means it's smaller and you have less square footage to live in. They're like, well, people don't want to be in their house that much. I'm like, that's not a house, that's a dorm. So I, that's the thing I think, uh, it's not against it, it's a part of the many solutions, but if that's the direction we're going rather than finding solutions for families, uh, which we do have in our city still, shrinking, but we do. We actually have more dogs than kids in many of our cities now, but we do, if we want to have families stay in our cities, if we want people to be able to afford to live in our city and to use our transit and to work in our cities, we need to think about how the housing we're building today will not allow them to do that in the future. Thank you.